So we're going to start uh, with, uh, as I said, that we're trying to start a post Marian computational overview uh, of how biological system works. And we, uh, we just did a marathon uh, cramming our brain with lots of facts. I say, if you can cram our brain with facts, we can, we can forget them just as quickly as we cram it in. So can we then retain some of it through some kind of a uh, comprehension yeah, into a particular framework? And this is the framework I'm trying to say that we need to understand the brain through a new framework which uh, focuses on selection. As I said, there's attentional selection. But before the selection, we may have to encode something. Let's say, can we don't have to throw away data selection? Actually, is a positive way of uh, saying things. Negative way of saying things is deletion, deleting whatever you did not select. But before we delete, can we can we compress the data as much as possible? That's the encoding. Okay. So we're going to start with the encoding stage and see how far we can push that before deletion. Of course, we have to delete only when we don't have another choice. So let's just the first lecture, how far is this encoding before the deletion starts? Yeah. And so the motivation is, let's say, can we then of course, understand by this deletion theory, it has to be falsifiable. Can we understand why it's a contrast sensitive function when you are taking that particular form, which I did demonstrate to you in the measurement? Now, can we can we derive it from first principles? You know, why is synthesis around the field? So, you know, why is the rest of the field actually changes in dim light? I showed you centers around, but sometimes it's not centers around, it's center expanding as around disappearing. And then we are changing, our, our, our hardware is changing. And what is the optimal distribution of the cones? Remember, we said cones are mostly in peak and the fovea. Can we derive it from principle that why is peak the fovea? Why is that and so on? Yeah. And what is the contrast sensitivity curve associated with the chromatic input? Is low pass, but in the, in the band pass for the luminance input? And, and, um, uh, and why are these color selective cells less selective to motion signals and vice versa? And so on. Yeah. Uh, can we predict the ocular dominance corner of, uh, remember I showed you V1, some cells are clustered into uh, selected to the left eye, into other to the right eye. Can we predict them? Yeah. Uh, um, why are the V1 cell double opponent for color, but in the in retina, the color selective cell are single opponent? Okay. And so the idea is uh, we can try to maybe put all these diversity of things into a single unified principle. Can we explain them? Okay, just like you know, you can have a Newton's law, which is very simple, but then you explain the whole universe, that'll be fantastic, don't you think? Yeah. And so, so the idea is, uh, 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 the idea is, can you look at uh, signals as uh, like a raw input S somehow get a transformation K could be linear, could be nonlinear, we find analytical solution in linear, let's see how far you can go with that, such that you want to do an optimization with whatever the objective function you want to formulate correctly. Therefore, you can derive what this optimal case should be, which will be maximum information extracted. And this is some kind of a principle, which is called efficient coding principle. Barlow's 1961 talked about it conceptually. Then the community trying to formulate more into mathematical form. Therefore, you can be precise. And let's see how much it goes. The idea is you have the signal plus noise. There's always noise, physical system, always noise. It could be very little, but it's still there. And then you do a transformation. And in the transformation, this is called encoding. Of course, in doing that, you will add additional noise just because everything physical will get something. For example, this is a linear encoding kernel. Yeah, of course, everything is discrete, whether it's space, Time, of course, you can continuous, but you can also discrete time based on the frequency cutoff. And then you say, can I objective function uh, uh, to minimize this objective function such that it will minimize the neural cost, but extract the most amount of information with this sort of like round modifier. This is the mutual information between the output O and input S. You want to extract as much of the information possible. So therefore, this is a way of formulating data compression. Can I have a lossy, lossless data compression without spending too much neural cost? What is the neural cost? Is the output neurons firing rate? Firing rate tends to be very expensive. Okay, every time you fire, you're spending a lot of 
uh, uh. and so let's try it with with a linear formulation with with uh, because rest of the field in retina is linear a lot of linear 90 percent of cells are very linear or at most a little bit of rectification and simple cells before the complex cells pooling is linear you can imagine it's linear so let's try that okay even though it's approximation and with this uh, you know this uh, neuron i and input j and uh, the j could be space Okay, so let's say five uh, five J's, and then the, the rest of the field. If it's space, then it's a spatial rest of the field. Okay, you can you can have different output nodes and so on. Yeah, and uh, but it could be time. Then you get a temporal rest of the field. Okay, it could be color. C uh, C equal to red, green, blue. So three dimensional. This is a uh, color tuning. And it could be a disparity. Uh, it could be you know which eye, left and right eye. So it's again a uh, uh, you know, you can have space, time, space, color. Can we derive them all? Okay, and therefore you have a one principle. Hopefully, derive all these biological uh, uh, rest of the fields. And if that's the case, like, hmm, I understood something. Yeah, that's the idea. Can we see how much we can push that way? Okay, now assume that input noise are completely uh, RID independent, um, identically distributed. Let's say Gaussian, uh, or doesn't know, doesn't have to be Gaussian, but let's say Gaussian. Okay, and then you want to find the optimal transmission k to minimize this objective. Um, and um, of course, it's a it's a multi-dimensional space a, a, a signal, and therefore we know it's multi-dimensional, difficult to get. Uh, it's just uh, expand too much, uh, but nevertheless, you can do a Gaussian approximation based on a correlation, and we use this bracket for correlation. Is this okay? Familiar with everybody using the bracket for this is means ensemble average, okay? With a probability, once you get the two two points correlation, you can write this multi-dimensional thing as a Gaussian approximation. Then you say, well, wait a minute, why are you approximating visual input as Gaussian? Is this a good approximation or bad approximation? Turns out it's actually a good approximation if you measure the, the inaccuracy in terms of entropy. But let's just say it is okay, okay? Because uh, later on I'll show you whether it is actually good. With this approximation, then turns out that, uh, of course you also assume it's, it's Gaussian, which is actually not a bad approximation. Then turns out that you can have a uh, analytical solution if the, uh, uh, Jeez, sorry, I, I forgot to say this neural cost is actually, I'm um, sorry. Whew, I did not actually show that what neural cost is. Huh? Did I show that? Mm, sorry, but anyway, the neural cost, you can actually define it. Oh, it's here, it's here, sorry, it's here, yeah. So if the neural cost is defined as this, okay, so. If the neural cost is defined by the output O's power, so it's like a dynamic range, okay? The more it fires, the more cost it is. Then you can actually have an analytical solution to this. And with analytical solution, you can actually precisely predict and test it, okay? And now basically do a derivative with respect to K, find a solution, and I'm not gonna derive this for you, but just give you the intuition. Turns out that this K can be written as a multiplication of three matrices. First matrix, KO, is just PC, principal component, just decorrelate, rotate, okay? It's also a normal transform, rotated original space. The second is gain control. So after you rotate it, you just do a dynamic diagonal matrix G for each principal component, give a particular gain according to this cost function. And the third is the unitary matrix. That's what's U. You can think about another uh, coordinate location in this n-dimensional space. And then you are free to choose. And you can choose such that you may have another u u utility function. Let's say I don't want the wiring of my cable to be too long, or I don't want my kernel to be too big, you know, things like that, okay? Because this is a very big freedom in n-dimensional space. But anyway, just imagine that's the case. That turns out the analytical solution, then it's fantastic. I just write it in this way so it's easier. For example, this n-dimensional plus noise, first of all, PCA transform, then it's diagonal matrix, then another. Turns out one of the best unitary matrix is just the inverse PCA transform. So this way you rotate back to the space that you started from. This way is physically more intuitive and it also saves wiring cost because in the brain the biggest space is occupied by neuron neuron wiring imagine you have n, n neurons and then you but have i started recording again i did yeah wonderful thank you very much and so that 
uh, and then then you can have if you go back to your original space by this inverse for each, uh, inverse transform then the wiring is minimal your brain doesn't have to be too big okay that's another cost and so therefore from this to the pca after this pca you do a gain control to each pca you get that after that you you do a multiplex to to, to find out okay and uh, this is you can call it multiplexing yeah it's remixing again so the conceptual step is just writing it up. Now, it turns out that what is the gain? And that gain really is used to satisfy your, uh, uh, to, to minimize your uh, utility, uh, your, your objective function. Okay, and so it turns out that this gain is like this, qualitative like this, okay? Let the horizontal axis, uh, uh, the vertical axis is the gain power. It's just the magnitude kind of thing. The horizontal axis is the signal to noise. So it's going from high signal to low signal. Why? Because people like to think about PCAs, going for the zeros PCA. First PCA is high signal. The last PCA is, is the low signal, okay? And so like this. And then it's having two terms. The first is just the, uh, it turns out that this, this only depends on signal noise to each PCA channel, okay? This is signal to noise, yeah? inverse signal to noise. So the first is just a low, uh, a low pass. If it's high gain, or it's high signal, then just a constant, keep it there. But when the signal get too low, shut it down. So this is the low pass, okay? And this is the correlation. If it's uh, the, 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 the first PCA, don't give it too much sensitivity. The smaller PCAs give it higher sensitivity. This is like a contrast enhancement. You're trying to give more attention to the later PCA, which is more or less taking a contrast among your signals, okay? And so therefore it's a multiplication of this, you end up having going up until the signals go back, go down. So this is a kind of a, in the middle, you are focusing in the, the middle band, okay? Intermediate PCA is most important to you. Okay, so this is the high signal noise region. This is called whitening, redundancy reduction. That means things are correlated between your nodes, remove these redundancy it will save you a lot of data compression that's what you do and this is like a whitening in space because it turns out one of the pcas in space is free transform okay uh, free transform is one of the pc if you talk about spatial coding so this is the whitening and then when the signal noise go too low okay you start to do decreasing that means you want to cut away most of these channels having noise just cut it away so therefore decreasing with decreasing signal you just that's the idea. Okay, let's practice a little bit, okay? Okay, many solutions of K are equivalent because of the, this, but the choice of U can be used to satisfy additional constraints, as I said. Okay, and all these three steps are just mathematical. They do not correspond to hardware in the brain because in the, in the brain we have many more than three steps. So obviously they're satisfying some other functions, but this mathematical just, just, just for us to, to understand. Okay, let's apply to stereo coding. Why stereo coding is a good thing? I say you we just have a two dimensional space. It's easy to see because the left and right eyes, okay, we ignore space pretending this is just two dimensional. And so the left and right eye, as we say, it, it gets combined in V1 where a neuron, V1 neuron can look at a region in both the left and right eye trying to add it up. You're trying to say, what is the, uh, 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 you know, ocular dominance current in, in terms of that, that this is, you know, this weighted sum from the two eye, what are these weights? Can we predict it from this efficient coding formulation? Okay, that's the idea. You can see the left and right eye, they're very correlated, this correlation. Uh, we are pretending just one pixel at a time. You can also say, I'm just looking at one Fourier frequency at a time. Imagine you look at zeros Fourier frequency. You just look at the average light in the whole image. That's the zeros Fourier frequency, okay? And if they correlate them, this diagonal elements is, is self-correlation and it's a co co cross-correlation coefficient is R, okay? And then you can go into the PCA space. One is the summation of the two i, the other is the difference between the two i. That's very intuitive. And so this is the summation. This is the average between the two i. That's the difference. That's where your stereo information is coming from. So if you have good signal noise, you want to amplify the stereo information. That's where the disparity is coming from. Yeah. And so after this uh, free state transform, you get zero cross correlation. So these are decorrelated. Now you can remove redundancy, you can save by just focusing on this channel. This is like a left and right eye, you just rotate it into free as, into the PCA space, the summation channel and difference channel. Great. That's the first step, okay? The second step, you want to do gain control. So what happens is this is the high 
signal noise in a summation channel, low signal noise is a weaker signal in a difference channel. You say, well, my let's say you are almost in the noise free region, there's no noise. In that case, you just want to expand this weak signal. Okay, that's the gain control because that's the important information you want. You have higher gain, so therefore, this is the ellipse distribution. You want to make a spherical distribution. That's what happens. Okay, so that's how you you know keep this low and keep this higher. You get a spherical distribution. That's your gain control in a noise-free region. Okay, zero noise region. After the gain control, you then Okay, in this blue axis, you rotate back into the original horizontal vertical axis. That's your multiplexing. Why do you want to do that? Somehow the brain wants to do that. In this case, you say, am I really saving much? But the nice thing is, if you do that, you go back to your original space. So in case the original signal left and right are, are not correlated at all, okay, then the whole thing is like going back. Then you really do have the minimum wiring. But anyway, that's what we do. And so after you do that, you see this is like a very, you know, it becomes this kind of signal. You already gain control and O1 equal to this, O2 equal to that. That's what you get. Okay. And this is when we talk about high signal to noise region when you want to amplify the weak signal. But if it's low signal to noise region, you say, okay, forget about weak signal. I have to cut it down. Okay. It's not quite written here. But anyway, you want to sacrifice the weak signal. You just focus on the summation channel. That means in low dim light situation, your stereo vision is very bad. Try it at nighttime. Okay. Can you see the difference? Can you do still threaded needles? You can't do that. Okay. Because you start to give away. Okay. So if you thread needle this way, that means you can't see still. If you thread needle this way, that means you can see still. Try it. Yeah. Okay. That's actually what happens. So if the low signal to noise region here, I already add signal to noise. So therefore you may still have a still elliptical distribution, but you say, hey, this is more or less noise in this difference channel. I'm gonna just sacrifice it. That's what happened. You sacrifice it, you just focus on the summation channel. And that means your two channel output, O1 and O2 are very correlated. So you retain a lot of redundancy. Why redundancy is good in low signal to noise region? Because redundancy is good for error correction. You probably have heard a lot of biology redundancy reduction, how that's great for efficient coding. But efficient coding, sometimes you actually want to retain redundancy in order to, to get your uh, uh, get better signal to noise and saving neural cost. Yeah. And all of these are not intuition, they're actually analytical solution. I just trying to explain in layman's language for gain some intuition. Uh, they are not intuition only, but this intuition is from this analytical solution that's coming out. Yeah. And so anyway, that's that's what happens. And so therefore, now let's apply actually to space. Now what happened is we have done it in two dimensional space, left and right, and we have ignored spatial dimension. In fact, each image is n pixels. We pretend it's just one pixel. This one pixel is one spatial frequency, one pixel, whatever, one component. But now let's go back to say, actually each image is n pixels for a whole image. Okay, but rather than n pixel, I'm going to have an n spatial frequencies. Okay, from low frequency to high frequency. But turns out each image, low frequency is higher. This is signal strength. Okay, low frequency, higher signal. This is in log scale, by the way. So this is the power law, kind of a one over k squared. Okay, so really high signal noise in low frequency region, and low signals in high frequency region. This is the original signal. Okay, in space. And then after you do the do the uh, uh, PCA, the summation channel and difference channel still go like that, okay? And it turns out that ocular correlation, that correlation between the two eyes is also very high and low frequency because you know your two eye may not be exactly the, the same, but in the, in the core scale, they're almost the same. So therefore correlation is one near low frequency, but in the high frequency spatial, really tiny detail, the two eye inputs are very different. So that you actually have lots of, ocular difference in, in, in this high frequency. But anyway, remember in the high signals noise region, you ought to amplify the difference between the two eyes. That's indeed the case. Amplify the difference between the two eyes. Okay, but give low gain. So, so the solid curve is for G plus channel, the channel gain for the summation channel, low, for the summation channel, but high for the difference channel because this is the high signal to noise region. But in low signal to noise, you do the other way around. 
that make sense? Am I being too fast? Is it okay? Okay, very good. Okay, so you get a low pass filter for the spatial dif for ocular difference and band pass filter for the summation. Is this okay? Okay, wonderful. That's what you get. Okay, that means your stereo vision more or less for the that disparity is low frequency region. High frequency, you cannot afford to do that that much. So you kind of really cut down. Okay. Uh, so therefore, high frequency region, you have G plus higher than G minus. What does that mean? The neuron is binocular. The neuron like to have the summation. Low frequency, the neuron like to have a difference. The neuron is more monocular or ocular opponent. And that's something you can then compare to the brain in V1. Is that really the case? If that's the case, you say, hmm, this theory is successful. That makes sense? Okay. Okay, so that we can continue. And uh, let me just watch out for time. And, uh, and uh, so therefore you can relate to a situation like a strabismus when people have a cross eye, their eyes are not very aligned. That means their ocular uh, correlation is low, their ocular difference channel is very high. What happened to them? You can also adaptation of stereo coding to light levels. Remember, if it's light levels low, then even the high signal region get narrow and narrow. So therefore the, the ocular coding in V1 should change. I'll show you an example. Okay, so imagine you're a hammerhead chap, the two eyes are really far away. You have low correlation, yeah? But if you have squirrel mouse, your two eyes are very close. And they can look in their brain, do they have more monocular cells in the hammerhead shack versus squirrel? Yeah, that's indeed the case. And what if you monocular deprivation, the baby is born, you, you know, cover one eye. Remember some of the people have the patching uh, treatment, maybe it's too late after their critical period. But anyway, you can also see the correlation for the horizontal orientation, and vertical orientation different because our two eyes are horizontally displaced. So therefore in the brain, you can predict that horizontal cells cells predict you know, uh, prefer horizontal rendition and more nuclear binocular and that's indeed the case so it turns out they they do make sense okay and so for instance here's a particular test of a psychophysical uh, uh test of a theory a theoretical prediction because the efficient coding what is the optimal k depends on probability distribution of signal so therefore if you change probability distribution then the case should change. In fact, the change within 10 seconds, most of change. You can change in one minute. Very quick, this is called adaptation, okay? Remember this K is analytical solution depends on the probability distribution. So let's see. Remember in noise-free region, the gain should be inversely related to the signal power. Okay, let's try that. Okay, here is an experiment where I put the uh, uh, left eye is a spatial grating, spatial temporal grating, and right eye is also spatial temporal grating. They go like this. Can I play it? Uh, come on. Okay. okay, they are spatial temporary flashing gratings. Okay, but turns out you're going to have a summation difference, it will be drifting gratings. Okay, because you just cosine, cosine, sine, sine, you could do that. Yeah. So one's drifting up, one's drifting down. You can ask observer, what do you see? Do you see it drifting up and drifting down? They say, yeah, it's the same. It's your first choice. Tell me drifting up and drifting down. So the chance they're going to say it's drifting one way or another depends on the gain G plus to it and G minus to it. So you can imagine the prediction is you can change these gain ratios by changing these signal powers, by changing these correlations coefficient. So when you change correlation coefficient, you're going to change the signal power ratio. Therefore, you're changing the gain ratio. Therefore, the answer to that question will change. Does that make sense? They're more likely to see, see this, this drift or that drift is going to change. That's the prediction. Let's see if it happens. That's the case. Okay. And so that's what you do. You let people see uh, like the identical image to the two eyes to so make their correlation very high, or you make them see photonegative image to the to eye, then we make a correlation minus one, very, very low, yeah? Or you can make them see independent picture and make the ratio, uh, correlation coefficient zero. And then once you have done that, they're gonna give different answers to this. See if they, as you predicted, does that make sense? Give me a signal, yes, no, yeah, that's what happened. You can actually do such an experiment, okay? And so test, you first adapt people, then you test them. You adapt people to these kind of example images. Okay, that's what we did. You first let them see the examples 
in this case, let's say identical image to two eyes. Okay, she like show them slideshows of the identical image to two eyes so that you make the correlation really high. Okay, you each time and then you suddenly show them the grating. Ask them, oh, does it go up or down? They have to give you an answer. They give you an answer, you go back at them a little bit more, you do it, you do many, many times. And that exactly as you predict, suddenly they used to think seeing this way, suddenly see another way. You only need to adapt them for one minute. So your brain's wiring is changing in one minute, really quick. Okay, so that that really, you know, adaptation, you view the dichotomy of the image, a particular ocular correlation, then a test trial, you see, there's a drifting up or drifting down, and then uh, they usually show them brief inputs, they have to say drifting up or drifting down, then you do it again, repeat, uh, you can just manipulate them. Okay, that's how successful it, it, it just shows it's correct. Now that we have this intuitive understanding, let's apply to space time color coding that you're interested in. Yeah. So, for instance, you can first look at some intuition. Remember, we have left eye and right eye input. Now, pretend it's space location one, space location two input. You can do this again. Okay. The summation is just you know a bigger filter and difference. It's a contrast filter. So spatial summation, spatial contrast. So you say if it's uh, signal noise is high, you should focus on spatial contrast. That means the field should be small. Signal noise low, the field should be big. Same with time. Predicted coding, coding when you are trying to do the tempo contrast, sustained response is uh, the other way around. It. So let me just show you an example of them as well. OK, in spatial coding, what happened? PCA is actually Fourier transform. So you start with a spatial input with noise. You do PCA, Fourier transform. Then gain control to each Fourier transform. Uh, for each component, give a particular gain, okay, according to this objective function you're trying to minimize. And then afterwards, you can do inverse Fourier transform. That's exactly what happened. You can predict the field just like that, okay? And so let's see how it goes. This is your original signal power in the Fourier space. Okay, this is you know two two dimensional frequency, spatial frequency, horizontal, vertical, and the most power signal power is in the low spatial frequency, zero spatial frequency. Okay, and you can also do it by the magnitude of Fourier frequency. Okay, so you can see it's one over k squared. This is the fractal image properties of our natural scene scale invariant that goes like this. This is for this particular image looks very noisy, but if you average over ensembles of natural scenes, it's one of a case scale. Very good. If you can remove noise, okay? Sometimes there's a noise, the white noise comes in. Okay, the, so therefore it's one of a case where noise is white. This is spatial frequency versus signal power. One of a case where it's a pure signal, white noise, flat, yeah? And so you can imagine this is white noise, so therefore this is the high signal to noise region, and this is a low signal noise because this is the signal much, much larger than noise. Notice that this is a log scale, so it's really high signal noise. Okay, this is low. And therefore, in this region, this is the gain you should apply to it. When a high signal noise, you want to have whitening. That's exactly what happened, low signal noise, whitening, such that this gain times this signal will be flat. That's what whitening means. Look like a white noise. Yeah, okay. Give me some indication too fast, too slow. It's okay. Okay. So now the low signal noise is really, you have to cut down. This is what happened. It cut down. Okay, that's what happened. So the smoothing, that means you want to average out the noise by, that by low pass in that particular region. Yeah. This is a low pass filter. This is a high pass filter. High pass, low pass, add together, it's band pass. Yeah. Okay, so therefore, what is this? Uh, this is the band pass. Do you see this band pass filter? Fourier frequency from low frequency to high frequency. Contrast, high contrast, low contrast. Okay, where is the border of visibility? It's this, is it? To all of you, no? You, here, you, you know, the border of visibility is that. This is your visualization of this filter you just predicted. So, yeah. Uh, could you be, be a bit louder? Yeah, this is just my example. Yeah, but do you see that, you know, here you can't see the, no? So that this is beyond your limit. But this you can still see. 
Here you can still see, but here you may go further here, this limit, yeah? This is just a little bit of a demonstration. You can visualize where your visibility is. Because let's say, where the contrast get lower, lower, you cannot see anymore. At low spatial frequency here, you can still see that maybe by then you cannot see anymore. But higher spatial frequency here, I can still see this as well, here get to the limit. But even higher spatial frequency, maybe here you already reached the limit, no? Depending on your viewing distance, okay? Because the spatial frequency, obviously, if you look further away. So I'm just giving you an illustration, yeah? This is a, a, a qualitative thing, okay? Depending on how far you're sitting. Okay, and depending on your screen and stuff. But nevertheless, this is a demonstration of this efficient spatial coding. So if I can raise the noise bit higher, then you will even hit the, this peak. This peak correspond to where signal noise around one. So therefore, if you raise your noise bit higher, the peak will come at a lower spatial frequency. If you're, yeah, so your, your, your field can change. So anyway, this is how it goes. And then you can just multiply your K out. You can get your filter and you see the filter if you multiply it out. This is a Fourier transform, which is going like uh, looking like this. This is the inverse Fourier transform, look like that. And that's what your filter is. So this is a filter, band pass filter. You, this is your center slow the field. So center slow the field in the retina can be derived just from this first principle. And that's very satisfying, okay? And in particular, the scale size of the filter correspond to this frequency, because this is more or less one wavelength of that frequency, they're your peak frequency, yeah? Okay, now, this is the I's input node location, this is the J's, uh, this is I's output neuron, this is the J's input location, this is your rest of field. And because it only depends on these two, two differences, that means all the output neurons have the same shape of the rest of field, just shifted in their center location. So you can have a whole retina array derived like that. And they all have the same shape of the center of the field, just shifted in center. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, that's how it goes. And you can also have a prediction. Imagine in the high signal noise, you have your signal there high, low signal noise, it drops down, your, your noise is still there. So imagine this is nighttime, okay? This is your sunny day, okay? And so that in a sunny day, your nighttime, sunny day, you will have a band pass filter, this peak corresponding to this location because it peaks near the signal noise equal to one. In the dim light and nighttime, okay, it's there. So what happens, remember here, you get this receive field, what happens to that? You have to go like low pass. So therefore your retinous receive field changes from this to that, as you go from a sunny outdoor to dim indoors. Can you tell the difference? Yes, of course. Your spatial acuity will be higher in this situation than that. So in a dim indoors, you can't read. You have to turn on light in order to read. Why? Because you want to make your receive field go back to that situation. You want to read better, yeah? That's what happened. It takes just a, a one minute. Neural receive field adapt their shape to signal to noise and you can go measure it and people used to know know that they don't know what happened and they just ignore it now you can see this is understandable and this is the optimal use of for instance in this case you you have this signal plus noise go down go down and the pure signal actually go down like that okay but the noise will flatten out that means your noise is somewhere around here Okay, so, so the signal plus noise is actually this curve. That means the pure signal goes down like that, but noise is around here. And therefore, signal noise equal to one around here. That's where the optimal filter peak should be. And that's this, perfect. It is signal plus noise, you go that. However, okay, this is your perfect optimal filter. However, if you go too high, you'll get to this. Then you have a lot of noise because this is a lot of noise. You just let a lot of noise in. And there's all this pe salt and pepper noise is there. This is not a very good situation, okay? This is when you, for instance, you're sunny outdoor, you see everything clearly, and you suddenly walk indoor, pooh, you can't see. This is what happens. This is when you suddenly walk indoor, what happens, okay? But, but if you filter like that, then you will see that. So when you're going to from outdoor to indoor, you have to take about a minute before you see, or 10 seconds, that's what happens. And you can also apply this in time. Uh, and so Fourier transform in time, okay? They're, they're the same, just like a space, except you need temporal causality because 
temporal filter need causality, and it's on one dimensional time rather than two dimensional space. Everything else the same, then you get that, and then you I should really hurry up a little bit. Okay, so uh, so so this is the temporal uh, filter in, in temporal frequency space, and this is in temporal temporal space. This predictive field coding filter that you can also derive it. Okay, and this width is uh, roughly correspond to the optimal frequency in the temporal frequency, uh, and that should also adapt to signal noise. And you can do your own psychophysics experiment to see whether that's the case, and it should do. Okay, and um, you can also apply to efficient coding in color. In that case, color is three dimensional RGB, and you have a three dimensional uh, correlated correlation matrix. Yeah. And now it's okay, you can correlation matrix and do the PCA. You gotta remember we had this PCA space already. Okay, and then turns out that this in uh, you know, luminous channel, RG channel and BY channel come out of that. And then from that, you can even see what if a different dichromat. So some species or some of our color blind individuals among humans, we only have two type of cones, then what happens? So imagine it's red, green, dichromat. dichromat. You can have this two by two matrix, just having your stereo vision analogy, you can then apply, yeah? And it's very nice. And you can also explain color adaptation. How come, so for instance, something looking originally purple, like original color is because the red green channel is act this component and blue yellow channel that component activated. And then you adapt, let's say you go to a disco where they flashing blue yellow light all the time. So therefore, in your disco suddenly things flashing flashing like that a lot, then you have to adapt to that gain because the signals is very strong that way you have to reduce the gain in that channel. Therefore, you have to go like that. So whatever your purple color suddenly will look reddish if you go to disco like that. Okay. That's why if you go to a night market trying to look at your uh, nice little sweaters to buy, they say, oh, wonderful sweater. <laughs> you know, the daytime is going to the colors are awful because of different lightning situation, your color coding change and then the appearance, the color will also change, yeah? And uh, yeah, you can also uh, multiplex space and color. So imagine originally you, uh, so in multiplex space or so color, RGB is a spatial function. You have to have these uh, kernel in three by three matrix go to the uh, final spatial output, yeah? And so now the, uh, the, the, the correlation matrix is really a, a, a tensor product is a spatial correlation matrix times color correlation matrix and you do it again and let me just give you intuition okay original three cone images red green blue spatial images you first of all decorrelate in color dimensions you get luminous image rg image and blue yellow image okay i don't know why these things are there anyway ignore these two things okay it's my slide making errors and then you do efficient coding in Sorry, let me just delete these two things. Okay, so yeah, you start with your uh, three uh, PCA space in color, three you know, luminance, okay, luminance, red, green, blue, and then you do efficient coding in space. Remember, this is a high uh, signal noise in luminance channel, so therefore your Spatial resolution should look like that, but these are weaker channels in color, so therefore your spatial resolution should be like that. And then, you know, because they have different signal to noise, then you multiplex, you get these things, and that's just like that because this is like, you know, this is in 1D profile, okay? Red plus green, it's the luminance channel, okay? Center solar resolution, but this is a low pass, so for like that, red minus green, yeah? And you multiplex them together, you get, you know, red, red center, it's still red. Green positive and negative green, no green. Minus green, minus green, still minus green. So you get red center, green surround. This is your retina channel. That's exactly like experiment. So this is very satisfying, you know, efficient coding, can we uh, can understand this? Okay, then the bad news start to happen. This is what Shannon says. In 1956, it will all, remember our original idea is how much can we push the efficient coding data compression before we start deleting data? It turns out that as if it's starting at V1, okay? So this is what Shannon says. 
he wasn't studying vision. He was just in 1950s where everybody trying to use the information bandwagon, trying to understand everything in the world, including, yeah, actually, yeah. Anyway, he says, it will be all too easy for our somewhat artificial prosperity to collapse overnight when it's realized that the use of a few exciting words like information, entropy, redundancy do not solve our problems. All our problems. Okay, so what happens is, you see, can we extend efficient coding to V1? Turns out that that is where problems start to happen. In V1, everything still goes from the Fourier transfer to gain control, but it's not inverse Fourier transfer anymore. It starts to expand. V1 is 100 times as big as retina in terms of number of neurons. So this is called overcomplete. Yeah, and why is it overcomplete? Is it redundancy reduction? Obviously not. Yeah, is it any cost in there? Of course there's any cost, lots of cost because each neuron is very, very expensive. And uh, even though you have all these Gabor filters, but these Gabor filters really overlap, okay? They, they, the, the frequency space really overlap. Yeah, and they overlap way too much. Uh, you could say, let's forget about this overcomplete because in the front, the gain control is still the same. Can we use these gain control and all these to understand V1 rest the field? Just ignore the fact that this is overcomplete. Okay, so therefore we're still trying to push far. Let's push it. And it turns out, yes, we can. We understand all these rest of field, this shape and different complexity shapes uh, among, you know, you, because when you multiplex, it's not just multiplex this way, it's multiplex that way. Okay, because now you have to multiply two Gabor filters, not two center surround filters. And then you find these strange kind of rest of field. Yes, they are indeed just like in V1 neurons, if you ignore overcompleteness, yeah? You know, color orientation, conjunctitude cells coming out, a macular effect, which is a psychology phenomena comes out. And you can even apply to space uh, uh, ocularity. So disparity, selective neurons come out, turns out that a lot of disparately tuned cells or to low spatial frequency. Yes, they come out and binocular tuned cells to high spatial frequency. Yes, they come out. They all come out if you ignore overcompleteness. So you can say good news. Efficient coding as far as gain control, all the way it goes. But as far as low components, it doesn't go. Or you can even go to motion direction selectivity. You know, you have to multiplex space with time. They all come out and that's wonderful. Okay. But anyway, that's what happens to V1. And you can say, well, in fact, there is space time. There is a chromatic to chromatic. Okay. And there is ocular summation to ocular contrast all of these are kind of in pca space okay that means very high signal to low signal very high signal to low signal very high signal to low signal and if you have multiple dimensions space time color and ocularity which is the binocular disparity and stuff then the signal strengths get weaker and weaker and you should have smaller gain that's why in v1 you kind of don't have neurons tuned to more than two features, okay? Fewer neurons tuned to triple features among space, time, color, and disparity, or ocular dominance. That indeed is the case. So the gain control really make us understand. However, here's the problem we need to face. We have to face it. Problem in understanding V1 based on efficient coding. There's no apparent bit rate bottleneck after the optic nerve. The you know, optic nerve is going the signal, download the signal from your camera to the CPU. There's a long distance to go from your eye to the back of the brain. Maybe this is a bottleneck. But once you reach V1, where is the bottleneck? We don't know, okay? There's no quantitative or demonstration that V1 significantly improves coding efficiency after retina just by expanding the number of neurons by 100 times. There's no demonstration like that. So we can wishfully think that's the case, but that's not the case. 100 times as many neurons in V1 than in retina, highly unlikely the neighboring neurons are more decorated in V1 than in retina. So there's no redundancy reduction in a sense that needs 100 times that much, especially a lot of V1 neurons are still linear filters, even if you call it, do, do, do this max pooling by the complex cells, by, you know, do squares and uh, energy model, it would not explain it to with 100 times. As yet, no reliable measure of data rate in V1 neuron to show whether or how the cost of having mass rate more neurons is justified by improvements on coding efficiency. 
energy saving or exposing the cognitive putatively independent components. So people talk about ICA, maybe that's a nonlinear ICA component analysis. I do not have time to dive into the details, but if you look into the literature in my textbook, there's more discussion in details about that. And people say, can we formulate the efficient coding differently? Can we call it you know, sparse coding or whatever? Also doesn't work because unless you've changed something qualitatively fundamentally different, just a little cosmetic change doesn't work, okay? So that also doesn't work. So therefore it's time for us to remember what Shannon says, that maybe everything about information, bits rate and uh, entropy just doesn't work, okay? There's also things about translation scaling learns. These are completely beyond efficient coding. It's not a matter of bits, yeah? And information is a meaning, not just, uh, amount so for instance if i tell you a number 3.14159 as far as information is concerned the first digit three costs as much information as the second digit one as the third digit four yeah however obvious the first digit is more important so there's something important and meaning beyond it and so the information selection and the meaning of information may matter so somewhere we have to select if we cannot afford to do all these codings, yeah? And we have one more minute, or oh, uh, five more minutes. So I kind of trying to overcompensate a little bit because the first lecture I actually cut a lot, yeah? So the second lecture I actually am ahead of time, five minutes, but I hope it's not at too much of expense at, uh, you know, yeah. Is it okay? So maybe can we have a little bit of feedback from you? Any questions? Yeah. Yes, please. I cannot hear. Could you be a bit louder? Very good. So I, I think you probably get quite a lot. And the idea is indeed biology is sometimes says there's so many facts, but here we want to put it under one envelope. But you have a good question. You say, how do I know it's signal noise? So let me go back to, to this. I think the information correlation is signal. No correlation is noise. So the idea, this is a white noise. That means all these pixels are completely independent. So I think the brain knows its information when it sees correlation, when it sees correlation, okay? So therefore, and more or less when this flattens, it knows its noise. If you see a, a, a television channel completely flickering, there's no information. But by Shannon's measure of information, that's the maximum information. But the brain does not think it's information. Information is in correlation. Things have to have a causal relationship or have some kind of relationship. That's what information is. So you can say, yes, this is an informative region and that's not, let's just throw it away. Maybe a bit philosophical. As far as Shannon's concerned, there's lots of information in the noise, yeah. But I think the brain is looking for correlation. And so when we look into the situation where, okay, where is it? Okay, here, look, the signal is here but the actual signal plus noise flattens here. And I think the brain look for, it realized there's no information there anymore. If nothing is correlated in the world, we cannot predict and that's meaningless. That's what the brain is trying to do. Only things that are correlated, predictable is meaningful. And that's where in the end we say, it's not the information amount, it's the meaning. Meaning is in the relationship. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, very good question. It's the meaning that matters to us. Yeah, very good. Mm -hmm. Yes. If I need to break the probability over the witness from, from the fact that from the theory behind the, the cause of dependence, uh, that doesn't make sense for it to be like 100 times order if we want to optimize the amount of neurons. That's right. So, mm -hmm. we have a theory behind that, that the brain is actually efficient. Uh, uh, well, first of all, 
the brain uh, is uses, uh, using 25% of our energy. You know, we have a 50 kilo body and this is less than half a kilo, but it's using 25% of our energy. It's very expensive. So if you want to expand 100 times, it must be worth it. But for efficiency, and so all of these are arguing that it's not possible it's for that. You know, it just doesn't make sense. And they're not decorated. All these neurons have very similar Gabor functions and they, it's obviously wanting uh, redundancy. Redundancy for doing what? Turns out that in the next lecture, you'll realize that if, if you want to build a saliency map, if you want to be quick, over completeness is very useful. So the idea is the saliency map, you want to select the way do I get the world, you know, where you want to shift your eyes. Okay, you cannot say I'm going to compute one minute before I decide to shift your eye, you have to be quick. So it turns out that a redundant situation where you just want to compute a single max, that's the quickest. Well, you cannot quite prove mathematically it's quick, but that's one of the quick way. To do that, a redundant and highly overcomplete representation is very helpful. Because then you don't have to say, oh, do I do weighted summation? <laughs> yeah, a weighted summation, we calculate the weights. Yeah? And what do I have? Do I wait a huge, you know, this kind of thing? So there is a computational complexity versus speed that you have to do trade off. And that is not in this efficient coding formulation. So that's why we need to ask the new question. And recognizing that our brain does have this information bottleneck, that we do have to uh, do this kind of a quick uh, where to turn my camera to uh, in survival and with a brain that only operates at 10 watts, not a CNN with a NVIDIA take us uh, how many kilowatts, I don't know what is the computer they're doing. We are really operating at 10 watts, a very small uh, power. Uh, that is not a proof uh, that this has to be the way, but it's a, it's a justification of motivation thinking. Ah, yeah, thank you. Yes, please. I cannot hear very well. a bit louder, please. Yeah, we pop, we do use a prior, so that will be very much into the next uh, lecture. We'll talk about information selection, okay? So we need to select based on prior expectations as well as uh, non-prior expectation. Now, obviously, if we only do prior expectation, the world will be beautiful to us because I don't like to see the ugly pictures uh, that's happening, yeah? And so we can filter, if we say, I just want to see the beautiful world, but obviously not. Yeah, so we will sh I will show you some examples how blind we are, which shows that we do throw away a lot of information, but we also show where we are not blind, that we actually do pay attention to emergency situations that can save our life, even if they are ugly. Yeah, and so that is called top-down versus bottom-up selection. The top-down in the sense that what you expect, so for instance, you're looking at me, you, you are selecting me. But if suddenly a tiger jumps out in the peripheral, you better notice that you don't want to be blind to it. Yeah, so that will be the next lecture. And uh, next lecture will be kind of a, yeah, 11.10. This is a shortish break, uh, 20 minutes. Yeah, 11.10 next lecture, yeah. I, I'm happy to keep on asking a question here, so I don't mind, uh, yeah. But 11.10 we start, yes, please. Uh -huh. Thank you, Dr. for the presentation. Uh, I'm sorry, I will not be Mm -hmm. um, so my question is this, that does the brain learn higher level concepts without learning the lower level concepts? I don't know. So one of the, the purpose of this tutorial is also to kind of articulate to ourselves what we don't know. So uh, to be more precise, um, in, the, in, the, in the cortex, mm -hmm. the, the bottom of connections make sense, but there are certain top down coming. Yeah. But if we look at architectures like ResNet, mm -hmm. everything goes forward. Mm -hmm. But if we try to make skip connections backward, then we run into gradient loops. Like the back, back row part work on a cyclic graph. So, so like, what do you think is the biological significance of those connections? 
uh, they are very useful uh, because they first of all exist, yeah. And secondly, uh, in the brain, we don't uh, we we have a multi scale in time of decision making. So sometimes we have to react very fast. Maybe feed forward sweep is enough. In a difficult situation, we actually slow down. And you can actually record in the brain, you realize that the signal very early on does not have much information, but if you wait longer, it does. So this recurrent loop is going on. You can do experiment by uh, kind of cut the circuit short by this called transcranial magnetic resonance uh, no, no, so sorry. Transcranial magnetic stimulation. You're just gonna at the feedback time at the right time, and you cut it off, and then you see the perception is different. Yeah, and so these things are going on. So in a sense that when I'm explaining to you some of the things, I will also explain where we actually don't know, and hopefully by the end of the day we will see. Wow, this is we know that we don't know. That is very surprising. We don't know. And I hope to then we even have a richer discussion to answer the question. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, please. Uh, thank you for the talk. Yeah, yeah. I have a question. Uh, maybe the gentleman, uh, you mentioned that uh, instead of the reverse, uh, the reverse burn transform, the just after the gate control just goes to the forward complete neural that we want. Yeah. So does it mean that we want it processing the electricity rate instead of the uh, no, because uh, not only it goes to overcomplete, but also do the multiplexing. Yeah, so therefore, uh, okay, this is not only 100 times, uh, let's say one time overcomplete. So, but it's multiplexing in reverse Fourier transform. Yeah, it's actually back to space again. But you could do 100 times overcomplete and going back. Yeah, so. Remember, this is actually multiplexing all these channels back into the spatial space. So V1 is actually a retinotopic map. There's a space time core, space to space correlation between a V1 location and the image location in the retina. So it goes back to space again. So the overcomplete neuron is uh that's right so overcomplete in a sense uh like uh where is it in a sense that uh yeah in a sense that a lot of these bands are very overlapping yeah so imagine you know i have like a you know i i, I hear they over, over a little bit but actually they really overlap yeah and so in the retina, we have, what is it? In the retina, we have 1 million uh, retina ganglia cells. Just imagine you have a, a smartphone camera, 1 million pixels, not too bad. Huh? These days you can't find million pixels. <laughs> so 1 million pixels is not too bad. But in the V1, you have 100 million. Uh, why does it want to do that? You know, you cannot grow more information because information in each, cascade down you can only lose you never gain more yeah so what are you trying to do you are you are implementing an algorithm yeah yes so i don't know i missed the first bit so i don't know if you addressed this but in this uh like frequency plot you have the different uh responses of the different uh um, different uh, bands yeah, yeah, like so you said there's a spatial component. So you each uh, each one of those bands is going to correspond to. Um, the frequency filter band. Yeah, you can say this is the frequency filter profile. So you'll have the neurons with the same filter. Frequency. That's right. So for instance, you say this the for instance, this this neuron is tuned to the or, horizontal orientation, very small. They correspond to this ellipse frequency band. But you should have. Uh, more than one neuron with the same response at different Correct. Yeah, yeah. In order to have 100 time completely, you really tie them up. So my question is, is there some uh, geometric layout in the V1 that corresponds with which filter with each neuron? Like, are neurons of the same band nearby each other somehow? Are they arranged? Basically? That's right. So in V1, first of all, neurons tune to the same spatial location. And each other. 
Secondly, neurons tune to the same orientation near each other. Thirdly, are the neurons tune to different frequencies the same frequency near each other? That's not so clear. Okay. However, neurons tune to the same eye near each other. Okay, and neuron tune to the same color near each other, that's not so clear. Okay, it's really a multi-factoring space and and uh, yeah, the obvious most obvious is space and orientation. Frequency is more general. Yeah. So imagine, let's go to the extreme. Let's say we actually don't do any multiplexing at all. We just stay in frequency. Then the original pixel space just goes to a Fourier frequency. Field. That will be it. Then each neuron will have a sphere as big as the whole image space. Yeah. And then you say, if I don't have overcompleted, so you have one hundred uh, one million pixels become one million Fourier waves. Yeah. That would be like that. So one hundred overcomplete will be. One million frequency waves, but each time each wave done it one times. That will be just like that. However, instead of that, we just multiplex different frequencies. Uh, rather than one frequency at a time, we multiplex this frequency band local region together, combine them together into a spatial filter. However, we still do one hundred times, but then you just overlap rather than just one filter will be one. Over that, trying to kind of smear out the space to make it more even. It's like a pyramid, like an image pyramid. A little bit like an image pyramid. You can say, why do you have this scale rule filter? You know, a lot of these scale rule filters, you only have like a two times, three times over. That's enough. Yeah? So this is one time. Yeah? What is the steel, current day scale rule filter? How many over here? Two times. No? Well, it's a parameter. You can, you can choose. Two. Yeah, yeah. So normally it would turn to a hill. Yeah, maybe three times. Three times, yeah, but that's good. Usually it's a three, yeah. So let's say if it's just two orientation, there will be one at this point. So you know what I mean? You can make like one. None of us have to do And is there some like number of orientations or scale, or is it just sort of? Actually, we don't know how many orientations. So people kind of simulate it as if. As if, uh, because it's hard to say, let's say I can say 10 orientations, is it really clear when you measure it in neurons? You cannot measure to such a uh, accuracy that you can say, oh, 10 discrete orientations. No, mm -hmm. But each neuron is tuned to an orientation bandwidth of uh, about 30 to 60 degrees, so therefore it's hard to say. Mm -hmm. So I have another question, but that's a very basic question. Please oh, forgive me. Yeah. I, 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 I like I think you you guys seem very good because I've really compressed the whole thing for the whole lecture and then you ask these questions that means you really guys follow. Yeah. So my question is simple that um, when I look at a scene mm -hmm. from a camera, I just capture it, pass it for one. Yeah. So I assume a single fixation. Okay. But when a human looks at an image through his eyes, he, he the like I feel it in my brain that my brain does processing over multiple fixations. Mm -hmm. So this seems like one of the loopholes in the models. And the second problem is that next section. We have to address that. Because this is again, yeah, it's like a dead wind on the mobile. And then uh, the second problem is like uh, what do you mean like does the brain assign order to objects in the like see Order to the object, I don't know. Uh yeah, in the end, you see the objects. As I said, we know very little. Yes, we do look at objects. For instance, we have something called object-based tension, but the next lecture. So this is really the encoding, the first step, yeah? We're going to look at the selection and decoding. So we are really just here. So this is really preliminary. And with this, we see that we hit the wall, that you cannot push any further. So we are forced to. So the idea is we hit the wall in V1. That's the idea. Then you're forced to do selection. And that's the interesting part. So therefore, vision is looking and seeing. Selection really is look. We actually select by turning our cameras around. Yeah. And then the intelligence really happens. You can say the encoding really is just image processing, not really intelligence. So next lecture, we have the intelligence. Then we take a break. Lunch break, then we go really, yeah. And then the last lecture, hopefully, you know, I think the way you guys are following, we're gonna really have interesting discussion. Hopefully, I can also hear from you, you know, saying, okay, steerable filter, how much is it? Big, wonderful uh, discussion points. Yeah, thank you. Yeah.
for the for the grain concentration. Uh, so it, it said uh, it's shifting from that price to be because to be more because that is this the kind of influenced by our legal experience or is that really influenced by some partner? It's from the uh, environment. As I said, this this depends on the probability distribution of visual input because this is the optimization situation where it's depend on the information this information depends on probability distribution of a, a signal okay and so therefore if you go from outdoor to indoor you go from rainforest uh, rainforest to, to beach it's a different ensemble distribution of your signals then your key will change immediately and one of the one immediately in a sense like a few seconds to a, a minute okay now, one of the things that uh, probability distribution does change is the signal noise. That's the most dramatic change. Okay, yeah. so therefore the brain just adjusts to it. Yeah. How, how does the brain learn to do this? Or is this something that you need to And so, one thing I did not address this is how does the brain change this K? Yeah, we only know what is the optimal K given the particular probability distribution. How does the brain, this is actually an open question. Uh, yeah, it will be a scientifically, uh, yeah. Uh, actually, don't know that. Remember, I say there's actually mathematically only three steps. Okay, PCA transform, gain control, and multiplexing. But the brain looks like a multiple step, more than three steps. So one suspicion I mentioned in the book is they are trying to use such that is the flexibility of change, because they've got to change within a few seconds. Remember, you go from outdoor to indoor, just to take a few seconds for you to see again. Yeah, in the beginning, you say, oh, so dark, I can't see. And then if you say, you are receptive field being changed. Okay, so remember in the retina, you have photoreceptors, then bipolar cells, horizontal cells, endocrine cells, ganglion cells, all of these, yeah, they all have a kind of different hardware. And this hardware is perhaps to make this change as flexible as possible. That makes sense, but this is only a guess. Okay, it's something to be uh, experimentally verified and. Uh, I guess. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome.